You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome, Father. Thank you, Teresa. It's good to be here. We're in show eight. And that's right. And last week, I, I thought about it quite often, and we were talking about the Vatican, St. Peter's, and, and uh, the Scave tour, and all that. Yeah. That's actually come up several times in, in conversation this week. I thought it was uh, kind of interesting yeah. that, that we recorded that. And now, um, today, we're talking about... St. John. Uh, John. We'll be talking about his book and his school. And it's it's going to be helpful to us to understand what a book and a school look like in the first century. So uh, we'll be using that as a technique. And then I think the other thing, too, and you kind of alluded to this, is that by studying the church in the first century, we're coming... Um, we're coming to realize that, and, and that it's a three-dimensional thing, that it's a real thing, that this is something that's actually true. It's not grounded in mythology or legend or, or whatever. We can go to the sites. They're there. We can uh, read the works of the people who wrote them, and as we're going to see in St. John, um, they're going to give testimony to what they themselves saw. And so I think that's another really important um, aspect in studying church history is that it's grounding us in, in fact, it's grounding us in our roots. Right, and not that we started in 600 or something like that. Yeah, know, right, yeah. Yeah, I, well, we'll cover Constantine. <laughs> and so, yeah, we'll, we'll show that the great apostasy is nothing more than a big flu flu. Right. That was invented about a 1,000 years or 1,300 years after uh, the uh, the event itself. So, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So we have proof right here. We do. And like you say last time around, we saw it in the tombs, and yeah. um, and we'll see it in the tomes now. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Good. Um, books. Books are interesting. Um, the uh, kind of book that we have today, I I have to tell you, uh, I don't. I'm not a big fan of uh, YouTube. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff on it. Um, but I was shown one uh, several months ago. Uh, it, it's it's called if you go to YouTube, it's called the Medieval Help Desk. Okay. <laughs> you know, if you have a computer, chances are you've had to call a help desk or get somebody in to help you with something or other. And then when it's all over, you think, oh, gee, I, I kind of figured that out on my own. But um, uh, this this is set in the Middle Ages. It's actually done uh, in Sweden. And um, the the YouTube uh, segment, okay. and it's set in the Middle Ages, and there's a monk in this room by himself, and obviously he's a scholar. He's got scrolls all over the place. He's got a book sitting in front of him, and he's just looking at this book, obviously disgusted. Knock on the door, fellow comes in, and he's the medieval help uh, uh, okay. desk help. Okay. And he said, what, "What's your problem?" And he, and he looks and he looks at this book and he goes, he says, "I I don't know how to open it. I don't know how to get it started." And uh, the man goes over and and he takes the the front cover and he pulls it back and the monk looks back and he goes, "Oh my goodness gracious! I had no idea." And uh, and he said, "Well now, okay, but but wait, wait. Th- this is this is only one one." Uh, Part of this, how? And it's in the middle of the sentence. How, how? What happens next? And the man goes over and he takes the first page and he turns it, and the, and the monk looks and goes, "Oh my word! This is incredible!" <laughs> so and he says, "But what if I want to go back and review what I had read from the first page?" And the man takes the book and turns it back in the other direction. Now. <laughs> It, this is so funny. It's only about a three or four minute segment, but it's so funny. And then at the very end, he puts it down and he puts it down backwards. Okay. okay. And it just as the help desk guy is about to leave, he goes, "Wait, wait, 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 wait. Well, I can't open this. I, it, it doesn't open again. You know." And, and of course, it's the binding that's on that side. And he goes, "Well, you turn the binding on the other side, and and then you go, oh." And he's flipping it back and forth, and it's just you know, And he said to the help desk guy, "He said, you know, it would have been helpful if." We had some sort of a, a manual in order to read this. <laughs> and the guy says, well, here's the manual here. But it was another book. Another book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. I'll have to go look that one up. Yeah. I, too, don't, don't look around YouTube hardly ever. So that's, that's funny. But that, that's, a, that's a good one. And, and it... Uh, <laughs> It helps us to remember that books, like we have books, were not always in existence. In the first century, in fact, up until almost 100 A.D., all books were actually very long scrolls. And uh, an analogy of this is if you, um, if you took a, um, a roll of paper towels, 
Okay. Now the kind that we have at home, we've got perforated. So think in terms of those uh, those kind of um, uh, brownish ones that you see in a public uh, facility. Okay. Okay. And if you were to take, that's actually around the same size. It's about ten oh, inches. Okay. They're about ten inches high, but they're forty feet long. Forty That's feet long. long. <laughs> it is a long one, and and it, it's made of papyrus. So today we we have our papers made of pulp that comes from um, uh, trees, mm -hmm. unless we have very good paper, and that of course comes from linens and, mm -hmm. and cottons and stuff like that. Um, but this this came from a uh, a reed, and it especially grew in the Nile River Valley, and so uh, this papyrus then is. Uh, um, and, and it lasts for a couple hundred years. It doesn't last forever. Most of what we have today that was made of papyrus, we have fragments of. Mm -hmm. uh, unless it's you're in certain parts of the Middle East where it's very, very dry, you can preserve this stuff for many centuries. But by and large, it doesn't last forever. Mm -hmm. you know, of course, our paper's not either. That's degrading. Right. So, um, And then what, what you did was you read the text from the upper left-hand corner and then you would read down, and there was a um, there would be columns uh, about the size of a, of a modern page. Okay. Okay. And you would read those. Now the, there were problems with that, and, the, and one of the problems was that there were no punctuation marks. I think I'd mentioned that before when we were looking at at the uh, right. at the cross. Yeah. Uh -huh. Who was at the cross? There's no commas. Uh -huh. There are no periods. There are no question marks. All of that's just there, one word after another, and there are no capital and lowercase letters. It's all uppercase letters. So this is very difficult. The only thing that you have to go by is that the first line of the first chapter, of, or of each chapter, the first line of each chapter, was written in red ink rather than oh. in black. Hmm. Okay. Ink. So that that's all you have by way of indications. So it's very, very difficult to uh, to read, and it's one of the reasons why, and we'll see this a little bit later on, also in North Africa, uh, there were a number of lector schools, schools for young men to study how to read, write, and, and all, you know, the, the, basically the trivium. Um, and, and it took years for them to get that down. So to be a lector in the church, was an incredible privilege and an incredible skill mm -hmm. to be able to proclaim the Word of God by way of reading um, this stuff because it's not easy, as we found no. out when we <laughs> played around with that that one time. Um, almost always then, all books were written with the intention of being read aloud. Mm -hmm. And in St. Augustine's Confessions, he mentions that... Uh, uh, he and others were surprised to find St. Ambrose out in, a, in an atrium reading a book, but without even moving his, his lips. Uh, so that was considered to be just a really extraordinary skill, to be able to read a book without moving your lips. Wow. So, um, there's an advantage, by the way, to, to papyrus. I, I would not be against going back to using those scrolls. And the advantage is that if you were to take a, uh, a book, a papyrus book, a, a scroll, and lay it out on a long table, it unfolds before you, so you get the whole thing. In, in our books today, we go chapter by chapter, page by page, and there's a certain disconnect. Mm -hmm. if, if we were to take, for instance, the Sermon on the Mount and roll out Matthew's 5th, 6th, and 7th chapter, we would find it as a single unity mm -hmm. without breaking it up into the little tiny readings that we tend to uh, right. today. And so we would see how those Beatitudes fit in as sort of a prologue to the, um, to the, the rest of the sermon. Uh, and we lose that, of course, as a result of the kind of books that we use today. But be that as it may, finances is what really drove, uh, drove this thing. By... Um, by 100 A.D., there was someone down in Egypt who had come up with the idea of taking some scissors and cutting these scrolls up, you know, right along their, their column lines. Okay. <clears throat> then what he did was he took the, um, uh, the individual pages and uh, he sewed them together on one side. And that became the binding. Mm -hmm. And that made it possible then for, uh, for them to use both sides of the paper. Uh, so that, that it, again, that became a, uh, an easier way of doing things. Um, it was cheaper as a result, and sure. these books were called a codex. Oh, okay. That's where we get the codices, okay. that, um, that, that term. 
And by around 200 A.D., uh, the the book, as we know it today, had pretty much taken over everywhere in the world except Rome. Hmm. And in Rome, even after uh, up to 200 A.D., they continued using um, the, um, uh, the the scrolls, uh, particularly in liturgy. So they were a little resistant to um, uh, to that change. Well, it makes sense, though, it, like you said, to uh, to have it all in a scroll. And right. Like yeah. Um, so why all this information? Well, it tells us something about what we're going to get into. Uh, one of the great scriptures, John's Gospel, uh, and then say also some things about his his letters and um, and the Book of Revelation. Uh, a great school because schools really farm around these libraries mm-hmm. of of these uh, codices and and scrolls, and uh, some of the earliest church fathers who come out of this particular school uh, of of John. And this is all grounded on one man. This is the son of Zebedee. This is that that young disciple who he never speaks of by name in in his own gospel, but simply as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Right. You know, it's a beautiful thing. Wouldn't you like that to be your, yes. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yeah. now, we had speculated a couple of weeks back as to whether or not there was a possibility that he was related to Jesus right. uh, by way of uh, Mary's sister. Mm-hmm. And, well, we'll just leave it for what it is because we can't find that out. Maybe, you know, <clears throat> someday in heaven might have an opportunity to quiz him on that, but uh, <laughs> we'll just let that go for what it's worth. But obviously a man who is very close to Jesus throughout Jesus' uh, years of ministry and remains very close to Jesus through his mother throughout the rest of her life uh, together. Um, We always find that he's always mentioned among the four big apostles, the most important apostles, and he's never mentioned first. Uh, Whether it's his gospel or somebody else's gospel, it's always Peter, James, and John, and Andrew. So the two brothers uh, teams, uh, Peter and Andrew and James and John, and those four are always mentioned. Uh, together, we know that he is a witness to the um, empty shroud, uh, empty uh, tomb. Uh, he speaks of the uh, the shroud itself as being uh, evacuated, uh, rather than Jesus taking the shroud off. He literally went through the shroud, uh, physically through the shroud, and uh, that the uh, that the sidereon, the face piece, was folded, uh, set over on the side. He also specifically says that although he got to the tomb first, uh, right. remember he's a younger man and Peter's probably been smoking all of his life and so mm-hmm. he's not as fast a runner. Mm-hmm. And, but when Peter gets to the tomb, he finds John there at the tomb looking in but not going in. He defers again right. to Peter and Peter then goes in first. I thought that was beautiful. Yes, uh, yeah, really, it really is. Um, he is a companion of Peter's in Jerusalem. Remember the two of them go to the temple together. The two of them went to Samaria to, uh, together in founding this, uh, the church, um, finding the church that, that Philip had found, and then founding the church also there um, the, by Philip the deacon, of course. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> he drops out of sight then. Uh, you don't hear much of him af- after that. Uh, there's some legends that f- fly around, apocryphal stuff. It's not reliable, so there's no sense in us spending a lot of time on that. Until we get to the later years where we find him in Ephesus. And there are those who believe that um, that he has a house. In fact, if you visit Ephesus today, there's a, a house that's there that um, is believed to be his house. And there's a small um, room off to the side, which is believed to be Mary's uh, home, mm-hmm. and certainly um, Orthodox Christians believe that. Uh, many Roman Catholics do, although it's not an, uh, a doctrine of faith or anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and many Muslims also um, uh, find that as it's a pilgrimage site for them also. Yeah. So in in Ephesus you have um, uh, you have John there, and and probably Mary also. But then you also have other disciples that gather around him. This becomes the, the school. And we're not talking about a three-story building with a gymnasium <laughs> attached. You know, right. what we mean here is a group of people that that are um, literally sitting at his feet, 
and listening to him. And they, these are people with great memories also. We have a tendency to forget that also, that, that people in the first century were much better at retaining um, information than we are today. Mm-hmm. And then they, they also had lots of techniques in order to help them with uh, memorization. You know, as a teacher, you know that, that you can give kids these techniques. And, yes, yes. And they, you know, they help. And they and, do help. And they do, yeah. Well, this school has a huge uh, influence on uh, Syria, on Asia, which, which is uh, today, of course, Turkey, um, and then beyond that uh, into Phrygia, even into Alexandria, and even into Rome. So John's school is going to have a, a huge in influence on that. And some of that is going to be both in Scripture, but also in uh, what we would call the elders, uh, his his generation, his ne- the next generation after that. Now we're right at the verge of going into the the second generation. Well, actually, we're in the second generation as we're looking at the 12 generations um, of the early church fathers. We're now into that second generation, and, um, and it, because he lives so long, yeah, are he they spans. at the time are they are they all the other apostles gone? Uh, or do we know yeah, they, they are? Yeah, okay. yeah, right. By this time, they're either yeah, they're all been He's martyred. The only one left. Right, yeah. Um, it, it is so important for him to emphasize the historical reality of the Bible events, of the, of the gospel events. And we find this embedded into his gospel, especially. Now, we find that also in Luke's gospel at the uh, prologue. You know, he talks about the importance of of getting the story down. Uh, but, but in John's gospel, it's, right, it's embedded right in. He says, um, what we have seen... He talks about that um, at the crucifixion, um, what we have heard and our hands have handled at the crucifixion. He uses that term. You know, uh, he, he says at, at the crucifixion, remember, he mentions that, that immediately blood and water flowed out. And then goes on to say, an eyewitness has testified and his testimony is true. He knows what he is speaking, that he is speaking the truth, so that you may also believe. You know, that's uh, in, in the 19th chapter of John's Gospel, the 34th and 35th verse. Also, right at the very end, we have a very interesting insight into John's school, because it says, this is the, the last verse of his Gospel, it says, It is this disciple who testifies to these things and has written them, and we know that his testimony is true. Now, there's, there's some personal pronouns here that give us some insights. It says, it is this disciple, John, the beloved disciple, who testifies to these things, and, and he has written them. He has written those, those words. And we, who's the we here? We is the school. So, and, and John has not just dictated, but he has written these words, and we testify to these because we heard them themselves um, we're talking about Papias uh, who is his student who is the tutor of Polycarp and we'll be talking a lot about Polycarp who is the tutor of Irenaeus of Lyon so we have these direct tie-ins of one generation after another sitting at the feet of the, of the individual before, passing on faithfully what they themselves have received. Twice in, in Paul's letters, he uses that very same term. I pass on to you what I myself received, and that's exactly what these people are doing um, with this. The earliest church fathers tell us that all the works of St. John are attributed to St. John, the Apostle. And, and sometimes you hear uh, people say that, well, you've got the fourth, sometimes they even call it the fourth gospel. They won't even use the word John's gospel. You have the fourth gospel over here, and then on the other hand, you've got uh, and one, um, uh, first John is, uh, yeah, that there's, there's a lot of terminology that's the same there. So you've got the fourth gospel and John 1, and then there's another person who writes Second John, Third John, and, uh, and the book of Revelations. Well, that's a 19th and 20th century creation. Uh, the early church fathers never said that. 
you know, you, you look and, and see what Justin the Martyr has to say about this. And remember, he was in Ephesus just 40 years after John's death. Right. So it's not like, you know, this is he's making this up from ancient history or anything. Yeah. This is very current. Uh-huh. And, um, and, and so nobody among the early church fathers would doubt that this John is the author of all of these books. It's 19th and 20th century um, guys that, that'll, that'll uh, uh, sow these seeds of doubt. Right. But I think if we step back, I, I think we can, we can see an internal um, uh, unity behind, uh, behind all of them. These five scriptures are under John's name, and there's a reason for that. And also the fact of the matter is that they use many of the same phrases. Right. So unless they're copying off each other, how many Johns there are, they're all copying off each other, it sounds like they're all written by the same person. Yeah. Um, many of the ideas are presented, and, and they're presented differently to different audiences, uh, but obviously by the same person. The knowledge of the truth, to, to, to know the truth, to walk in the truth, brotherly love, um, uh, to be from God, to see God. All of those are ideas that he himself is um, is, is, is placing. And in, there are so many parallels in, th- in the third letter of John, literal whole sections to the, the fourth gospel uh, that either some, like I say, either somebody plagiarized or, uh, or it's the same person. The fourth gospel is obviously unlike the other three. The other three are synoptics. They're somehow dependent upon each other. I won't go into all of that. Um, but the fourth gospel is, is definitely different. Many people have said that's the most beautiful gospel. That's their favorite gospel. And I certainly understand that. You know, uh, that's the gospel we turn to at, at the, um, uh, at, at the, at the end of, of Lent and prepare ourselves for the, um, uh, Easter experience. Um, here is it's a, a bold and a free expression. Uh, I love the irony that he uh, uses, the, the vocabulary that he uses. Um, it's obviously someone who knew Jesus personally mm-hmm. and was in love with him, mm-hmm. and and the other way around, obviously too. Um, the miracles themselves in John's Gospel specifically are are to manifest Christ's uh, divinity. All those those I am statements they only make sense. And if you if you look at your your Bible, you'll notice that the um, the publishers put the I am in capital letters to remind us that he's speaking the sacred name of God Yahweh, I am who am. Each miracle has a spiritual side to it. At Cana, it's not just about the wine; it's also a remembrance that here is. Here is Jesus, the incarnate word, changing water into wine, and that someday he's going to change wine into his precious blood. Yes. You know, it just it screams out at you. Um, the, the feeding of the 5,000, it's not about a picnic. Oh. You know, um, I am the bread of life is the, is the dialogue that happens, the, is, is the... Um, is the the preaching that happens immediately afterwards? That's a tie-in, yeah. <clears throat> the, the feeding of the five thousand, and the revelation that I am the bread of life. Uh, the man born blind tells us, "I am the light of the world." You know, um, Lazarus, "I am the resurrection and the life." He, he tells um, Martha that. You know, um, St. John takes the Logos idea of his day. He didn't invent that. Uh, It it had been floating around uh, somewhat before uh, Philo of Alexandria had been been using the term Logos, which means the word uh, in Greek, as a a way of personifying wisdom. And um, and, and so what happens is that, that John actually takes the uh, the the word itself, the logos, and and um, personifies it in a different way. Uh, the Christ, the Jesus, is the logos, and he 
is, is then you have a, a Christological sense of that. So he's not only a man, but he's also the Messiah and Logos in a different way. And it shows something of a relationship between the Father and the Son. You know, and, right. and so there's a, there's a, a Trinitarian um, theology to this gospel also that just steps. It's like, you know, um, what does Emerald Lagasse always say? Turn it up a notch, <laughs> you know, <laughs> bam. <laughs> and that's exactly what John is doing. And John's gospel is the last gospel. Um, and, and as I say, it, it's, it's independent. It's not dependent upon. And so you have that in the beginning is the Logos, and the Word is with God, and the Word is God. Okay, so that, that's pretty unclear. Later on, when we get ourselves into some of these uh, Christological heresies, mm-hmm. you have to wonder what translation of the Bible they were using. <laughs> Isn't this clear? Right. You know, we're, what don't you understand about that first line in John's Gospel? It's this Gospel that uh, Jesus also speaks to his audience, but also speaks through his audience to throughout the ages to us. In that, in that conversation that he has with Nicodemus, that conversation about being born again is not just uh, to Nicodemus, but to all of us. Um, when um, uh, when he is, there, there are all kinds of other um, ex- examples of, of uh, that too. I'm thinking in terms of the the uh, the woman at the well, and boy, that thing. I mean, every line there just talks right through that woman you know and right to right to us uh and and then even there's little these little ironies where uh remember the the disciples go off into town to to buy food and then they come back and he says well i, I have food you don't know about and they're thinking uh you know what did, did he get something to eat or you know <laughs> it's it, there's just so much in there that's just yeah. it's just uh, really good the other thing, too, that's neat about John's Gospel is that it's scrupulously correct, correct and, and uh, exact. You know, he, and he uses this for emphasis, too. He'll tell you what time of day it is, uh, usually in very short sentences. Um, I, I love the, uh, the story of, um, of his coming back to Lazarus after Lazarus has been buried. John makes a point in saying that uh, that Martha and Mary send off for Jesus, okay, and that after he gets the message, he dawdles for two days, right? right? But John also right. mentions that when he gets to back to Bethany, <clears throat> Martha says, don't roll back the stone. He's been dead for four days. Right. Uh, two, days two days, four days. In other words, uh, Lazarus was dead by the time um, Jesus heard about the, the death and not only that doesn't he tell his disciples that Lazarus is, is sleeping and I'm going to wake him up mm-hmm. and they go well if he's sleeping everything's what fine he'll right? sleep <laughs> and then he says no, no duh he's dead <laughs> uh-huh. and, and, and I was happy that I wasn't there so that you can come to believe so that whole resuscitation I'm not going to call it resurrection because like, later on Lazarus dies again but that whole resuscitation that takes place is full of tiny little bits of of, of meaning that helps us to know more about what is going on. That's one of the reasons I am convinced that, that Martha, when she sees Jesus, is not rebuking him. No, I, I agree. I agree. I you know? That's right. Yeah. Be, because when when he comes, I mean, you could read it that way. You go, well, if you were here, he wouldn't have died. Sure, right. You know? But, but it's not a rebuke because, you know, Jesus was already going to be coming back. She understood what was going to happen. Oh, you, oh okay. You, okay, I didn't... You think she knew that he was going to come back and... I don't know about that. Well, okay. he, no, no, she says that... She understands, though, that he... Is the Christ. Yeah, she understands yes. he's the Christ and that he'll rise again in the next world. In the next world, world. But, yeah. Okay, but you think he? She may have even possibly known. No, no, no. Okay. no. I, I'm talking I about. Okay. I'm talking about the uh, the general resurrection. Right, yeah. Yeah. I think she got that. Yes, yeah, she did, and and she also also knew that Jesus had the power over death. That he he could have saved Lazarus's life had he yes, been she, there. So it's actually a statement of faith rather than yes. of rebuke or doubt. Yes. Yes. Know? I think so. I th- I totally think so. And I always think about that, and I think. He's showing right there 
how intelligent, you know, Martha was, how much she understood and that, you know, that how you know, what a beautiful woman she was that right. she understood that. Yeah. And Mary as well, I yes. think that, you know. Yeah, because she does the same thing, sure. you know, when she, when she when she finally comes, yeah, gets off the lazy boy and goes out, you know. Um, but that's just one example of, of so, I mean, the whole Gospel of John is full of, of things like that. And then the other thing that's really fascinating is when he talks about Jewish customs, a lot of people have taken him to task on this and said, well, wait a minute, he was wrong. Because if you look at Jewish customs in 30 AD, there are several things that he mentions that are clearly incorrect having two high priests at the same time. And you've got to figure out, now, how does, this, how does this happen? What's going on here? But if you look at these passages, which seem to be contradictory, and you look at them not in 30 A.D., but after 70 A.D., and remember, he writes this gospel he's, around 90. Right. He's a long time around. <laughs> yes. He's actually reflecting the Jewish customs of his day. Okay. So it's, it's kind of another little fascinating point uh, to that, too, that, um, um, you know, he mentions that uh, that uh, Caiaphas is the high priest that year. And uh, this was in John 11, in the uh, 49th and 51st uh, verses. And that would not have been possible in 30 A.D., but after 70 A.D., it would have been, because there was a rotation of provincial high priests, that only happens after the uh, after 70 A.D. among the Hellenistic Jews. Now the high priesthood itself is going to be uh, wiped away within a generation, mm -hmm. but he's reflecting the Judaism of his uh, of the time of his writing, the right. contemporary right. Judaism. <clears throat> and we mentioned, of course, the the clever use of irony, double meanings, uh, and but all of this, I mean. In, uh, we, we mustn't lose ourselves in the literature of of of, of the book. It's it's more than that. And everything, the book itself is a is a a shouting out, a, a singing out that Christ Jesus is the Word incarnate, and that salvation comes through Him who is love. Deus caritas est. You know that's right out of His letters. Now then, also let's. Uh, take a look at, at uh, the book of Revelation and uh, I think that you know there have been a number of scholars who have looked at this book and um, have seen in it um, things that are not scary uh, certainly the book of Revelation has been used by a lot of televangelists to get everyone all worked up and scared that the world is coming to an end and send your money to me right away <laughs> you know <laughs> But the other side of this is that particularly uh, Catholic scholars, contemporary Catholic scholars, have seen a liturgy within the, the book of Revelations. I'm thinking particularly of Scott Hahn and his book, The, the Lamb's Supper. Wow, what a book. I, I don't think any Catholic should get out of this life alive without reading that book. If you go to Mass, you need to read that book. He's got goofy titles in yeah, his chapters, does. but boy, he's got a lot of good stuff behind it. And so I think it's, it's really important for us to, um, as we look at, um, at, at the book of Revelations, we see liturgical motif. Um, that book is certainly known to the the church of that period also and that period is reflected in that book uh, we, we know that it was it was written sometime between um, 85 and and, uh, and 100 AD um, on, on the island of Patmos uh, John says that himself <clears throat> and it's in the middle of the second great persecution this persecution is uh, underway through the emperor Domitian. Uh, the first great persecution, of course, is under Nero, and it's basically restricted only to the city of um, of Rome itself. As we saw last time around, he was he was covering his own um, political um, flanks by by persecuting Christians. Now, this this persecution by Domitian is actually much more widespread. It's, it starts in Rome, but it goes out into the provinces also, and it's particularly done through exile. We know for a fact that Domitian is very concerned about Christianity. 
um, and he's, he's not happy with what he knows about it. Uh, we know that, that uh, the two nephews of Jude Thaddeus had been arrested in Palestine. So there were investigators that had gone over uh, to investigate this, these stories and that they had arrested two of the um, uh, two of the nephews of Jude Thaddeus and then brought them back to Rome to be interrogated by the emperor himself and he was very concerned about are you descendants of King David and they said yes and this is our lineage and uh, and then he said he, he then inquired a little bit more, and uh, and said, "Well, is this Jesus Christ coming back uh, to be your king?" And they said, "Yes." Well, he's a little concerned right now, and he goes, "Well, when when's that going to happen?" And the two of them said, "At the end of the epoch." In other words, when the world comes to an end. Oh, okay. I think I'm safe. <laughs> And then he says, well, how much land do you own? Are you, are you great, powerful landowners, you descendants of King David? And it turned out that they owned a, a farm together of about 10 acres. Oh, okay. With that, he put them on a ship and sent them back. But it's an interesting incident to show how uh, Domitian was so concerned about this. And, in fact, there are others who are going to, um, at the very beginning of this persecution, are going to experience his wrath and fear. And I think particularly a uh, very important um, uh, individual in, the, in Rome. Now we're looking at Rome around 90 to 95 A.D., okay? And uh, this, this man is a consul. Remember, there are only two consuls in, in, uh, in the Roman government. And his name is Flavius Clemens. Flavius Clemens was executed. Uh, his charge was for atheism. That's a capital punishment. That's a capital charge in 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 Rome, uh, not believing in the gods, not believing in the gods. That is a constant theme for the persecution of Christians. They're con they're considered to be atheists because they don't believe in the gods. Oh, okay. Okay. And so uh, his execution is considered by just about everybody who studies first century and early second century uh, Christianity as as being a martyrdom. Uh, his wife is um, is Flavia Domatilla, and she herself is exiled out of Rome. She's sent away. But before she left, she donated her, her property. She had a, a big piece of property in Rome itself, and uh, she donated that to the church. Mm. And that the church then took that piece of property and turned it into a cemetery. And... Uh, their catacombs, Domitilla's catacombs, are in Rome. Again, you can go to these things and, and see these. Uh, she herself was sent off to a little island uh, off the coast of Naples. It's called Pandateria, and it was a favorite island. It, actually, there's another little island next to it called uh, Ponza, and Ponza Island is a favorite spot for <coughs> emperors to send people into exile because they can watch them. <laughs> And if you send them real far away, you, you don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But this way you could watch them. So they're, they're near uh, Naples. And then also if, if um, eventually you decide you're going to forgive them, you can bring them back you pretty easily. Back. Mm -hmm. Or if you decide you're not going to forgive them, you can send out an executioner and kill them. Uh, so it's, and, and that did happen. Those things did happen. Uh, this is a, a rough and tumble society. Mm -hmm. So now uh, Flavius Clemens is dead. He's executed. I am assuming that he was beheaded. That's the typical way of a Roman executing a, uh, a citizen. And uh, Flavia Domitilla is in exile. They have two sons. And one's name is uh, Titus, and the other is Domitian. So he's named after his uncle. Wow. Yeah. And the interesting thing is that both of them are Christian. So we assume then that the parents were Christian. It certainly sounds like it. And so the two boys, Titus and uh, Domitian, themselves are Christian. After several months of persecution, and here we have the exile of, of uh, John to Patmos and, and who knows how many others, but uh, this is a leadership persecution. They're, they're basically going after leaders and important people. Uh, ultimately, the emperor Domitian himself was assassinated. 
and um, when the word then came over to the, the Senate uh, that he was assassinated, actually I think there were some senators involved in that, um, they, um, they, they put their foot down and they said, no more Flavians. We will not have Flavians as, as emperors. And so as a result, neither Titus nor Domitian had an opportunity to become emperors. Can you, do you realize, Teresa, we would have had a Christian emperor on the throne in 100 A.D. Wow. As it is, we had to wait another 200 and something years. Right. But, wow, it's just mind-boggling. Well, you know, it's, a, it's a turning point in history when history didn't turn. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, back to Ephesus. Uh, John is um, uh, has wound up exiled at Patmos. It's the site of his writing of the Book of Revelations. And uh, as we begin that book with the uh, the address to the seven churches in Asia and Phrygia, uh, it, it's really interesting um, the way in which that's set up. Because if you were to take a map of um, Asia Minor uh, in the first century okay, and follow his letter by letter okay, those letters actually those cities actually exist uh, you know, the ruins are still there and some of the cities are still there but if you follow them one by one they actually go in a circle oh, okay. and the other interesting thing is that there's a Roman road that leads that entire way so as if you want to call them, which jumping a couple centuries and being anachronistic on this, but if one were to call um, uh, St. John the Archbishop of mm-hmm. that province right. or uh, the Metropolitan, uh, after all, he is the most important bishop there, it would be as though he were making a, a mental trip around his diocese yes. uh, or, or the province and visiting the various dioceses. And uh, that's just the beginning. Then when you start looking at what he says to each of them, it is full of John-style irony. <laughs> you know? So, anyway, I'd like to go ahead and, and maybe take a look at that, uh, that just that first chapter or so, and uh, and uh, talk a little bit about that. Because what he's doing then is he's leaving Ephesus, and he goes off to Smyrna, so he's going north along the coastline, and then north further to Pergamum, and then he turns southeast to Tiatira, and then to Sardis, and then south, I'm um, east southeast to Philadelphia. Okay, which um, is a is a Greek name. Uh, it means uh, city of brotherly love, right? Yeah. Philos, uh, love, and Adolphos, brothers. And uh, but there are many Jews living in that city. Many of them had left Jerusalem. Those who survived. The, um, uh, the fall of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., many of them had moved up <coughs> to uh, Philadelphia. And then he turns westward, and he would have gone through Hierapolis, but there's no mention of it. He doesn't write a letter to, or he doesn't mention um, a, uh, a statement to Hierapolis. And, and that's interesting that he doesn't, because that's where Philip, the deacon, ultimately oh. settles down. And, um, and and so he he goes beyond that as if it's not part of his diocese, you, you know. And then he goes down to uh, Colossae, and then Laodicea, and then he returns to um, uh, to Ephesus. And as I say, all of these follow a a Roman road that's been built that that goes um, through each of these. Each of them receives a pastoral warning. These are not pleasant. You know, if I were a member of one of those churches, I would be cringing. If I got a letter from my bishop saying these things, I would want to change my ways. You know, uh, First of all, Ephesus. He, um, he says, well, you know, some of you have been taken up with the fo- being followers of this um, uh, Nicolaitis. Um, and, and, you know, what's, what's this all about? From the um, book itself and then from other outside sources we know that um, that these were followers of an individual who was a, a syncretist in other words he was trying to take Christian ideas and mold them into pagan ideas to come up with a um, a common creed um, and, and, uh, and then 
um, well, we, we see this even today. There, there are people who will take, and it, uh, as, as late as Pius the 12th, we had an encyclical that specifically tells us, be careful in your dialogue that you're not trying to water down the faith in order to come to a, a common understanding. Right. You know, the, the common understanding is usually at the lowest point. You know. um, so anyway, <coughs> excuse me. God bless you. Um, so we find that that he's he's speaking about at Ephesus. When we get back to Ephesus, I want to tell you a little story about uh, about a, a Gnostic who was oh. who was there when <laughs> when he gets back. He goes on to Smyrna, and uh, there uh, this newly founded uh, what he calls the synagogue of Satan. <laughs> um, it, there, the church has been opposed by the Jews, and particularly this new synagogue of Satan. Uh, he says this. He says, uh, "I know your, I know your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich." Well, what, that's so ironic because um, Smyrna is a very wealthy port city, and so although he's talking about poverty and and riches, is he talking about uh, financial riches, or are you talking about spiritual riches right. by opposing the uh, the synagogue there? Uh, goes on to Pergamum, interesting city there. Uh, that was a, um, a a kingdom. Pergamum was a kingdom in the first century B.C. And when the king died, um, he did not have any heirs. And so what he did was he literally, in his will, he gave his kingdom to the Senate of Rome. Wow. And so that's how the Romans came to be in charge of, uh, of Pergamum. Well, the people there were, uh, in, in, in many cases, the Romans conquered, and they were not necessarily beloved. But the people in Pergamum loved Rome. Um, I, you know, go figure. But, but they considered themselves a very special uh, relationship with Rome because they, they had been given by their king to the Roman Senate, and the Roman Senate reciprocated, and was very nice to Pergamum. And so, by the time we get to John's um, ministry, we find that uh, there there is a, uh, a it's a center for emperor worship. Oh. When Augustus was uh, emperor, a few cities began proclaiming him as a god. And uh, Augustus never really liked that. He he knew he was mortal, and but but he had to go along with it. And in this in this case, this is one example of this. And uh, and and so um, when he speaks when he speaks to the church at Pergamum, we see this when the, within the context of many of the people, loyal citizens of the town, are also worshiping the emperor. And and so he he worries about that. He um, warns against that, as well as a lot of other weird cults that are floating around. At uh, um, Thyatira, uh, there is uh, a prophetess there. Now, she's not a Christian prophetess. We Remember, we've come across like Philip's daughters and, John, and uh, Paul's letters talk about the office of prophecy and, and the, the book of the Didache talks about prophets. Um, this is a different uh, prophetess. And what she's doing is she's leading people to the demonic and um and he 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 refers to her as the woman Jezebel. It goes on then to uh, Sardis and and at Sardis um he has only one admonition against them and he says you act like you're living but you're dead. You act like you're living but you're dead. It's um Oh, it's, it, it, we find that. It's so unfortunate. Even today, I, I hate to say, um, but I find people who have evidently no understanding of what the Eucharist is, and they come to Mass. Mm -hmm. But they come in late, and they leave early. Mm -hmm. I was talking with a, an, an uh, elderly priest uh, last week, and we came to the conclusion that there's a, an accounting uh, name for them. LIFO Catholics. Last in, first out. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I, th I think that many of our Catholics should reread um, his his admonition to Sardis. Uh, they're teaching their children 
the, the wrong thing. Yes. When, when you, week after week, arrive at Mass 10, 15, 20 minutes late, you're teaching your children something. And then what happens is that when you're an old grandma and, uh, and your kids aren't going to church anymore and they have uh, a child and you're a grandmother and you go, well, aren't you going to have the child baptized? And they go, well, it's not important. Now, who taught them it wasn't important? The one who came late to Mass, the one who leaves early. You know, so that's my little sermon for that one. But ah, I appreciate I think that. I <laughs> think it's important. Yes. goes on to Philadelphia. And uh, here we have a uh, another um, uh, city that was founded by the, the kings of Pergamum. Uh, it was known as the open door to Hellenism. Mm. And that, that was the nickname back in those days. Um, it would be similar to saying, uh, you know, we talk of St. Louis as the gateway to the West. Mm-hmm. That's our nickname. Uh, their nickname was the Open Door. And so in this, he, he puns. Uh, St. John puns when he says, I know your works. Behold, I have left an open door before you, mm-hmm. which no one can close. So it's, you know, there's a little pun that, that he uses right. with that. I think, if I remember correctly, when Pope John Paul II visited St. Louis, he punned on that gateway uh, idea also. It was kind of clever. And then, so finally, he uh, last letter he writes then is to Laodicea. He passes Heriopolis um, because, as I say, uh, that that's a uh, a city that already has a uh, a church leader, a founder in in, in Philip. And so at Laodicea, um, we know also from other sources that that Paul had written a letter to Laodicea, but it's lost. Uh, we we don't have that. It, so who knows? Somebody maybe will uh, discover it and find it. But we know that he had written a letter to Laodicea, but um, it, it's not found. He um, he says we have I have this against you, and that is that you're neither hot nor cold. You know. Well, don't we find that again, too? And uh, and then goes on and says, Buy ointment to smear on your eyes that you may see. Wow. Oh. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but the fact of the matter is that Laodicea also had, <laughs> it, it had a school of ophthalmology. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And so Laodicea was known for its study of the human eye. And, and and ointments and and other things to treat um, uh, eye diseases, and so, what a neat pun! That's fantastic, isn't that? Yeah. So then, after this instruction, what we find is that there is a development that is very similar to a liturgy um, that we that we have. We have heavenly worship, and as again, as Dr. Um, Hahn has, has pointed out in his book, and several others have written some really good things. Also, um, we we find the Santos, Santos, Santos. I think that uh, that Scott Hahn said that uh, the first time he. He attended a Catholic Mass. Did you remember his statement about that? That uh, he was shocked to find the book of Revelation jump out at him. Right. And Yeah, <laughs> it is. Um, we find um, uh, similar patterns referenced in 1 Corinthians and the Didache. Um, we, we find the 24 elders dressed in white robes, which is the sign of, of victory. Uh, there are gold crowns. They're four living creatures. Now, again, those four living creatures get into our imagination. We go, ooh, that's weird. But but actually, all you have to do is go back to um, Hebrew poetry of, of the period, and they represent all living creatures. And then in the second part, we go on to the reading of the book itself. And so here we have a lector. Now, who's the lector? Who is able to read this book? And no one but the Lamb himself. There are, is no other lector. The Lamb himself, who seems to have been slain. We have all the other elements that we have, we find in, in the Catholic Mass. We have um, a music. And in this case, the, uh, the sacred uh, instrument is a, uh, a harp. 
Uh, I've always been partial to uh, the trombone <laughs> as a sacred music. <laughs> First of all, because I learned to play one, and secondly, because uh, in the um, Psalm 150, they talk about the trombone. The trombone. Yeah. But anyway, in, in the book of Revelations, it's a harp. Yeah, I never thought my saxophone seemed appropriate for that. <laughs> <laughs> huh. <laughs> I guess not. It work right. <laughs> It's a reed instrument. Maybe, maybe we'll, we'll get it in there somewhere. Yeah. Um, incense, the use of incense. Um, it's done on the Lord's day. That is to say, not the Sabbath, not on Saturday, but the Sunday, the first day of the week, or as the early church often referred to it as the eighth day of the week. It's the day that breaks out of the uh, creation cycle and, and then gives us an, a new heavenly cycle that we deal with. John is, uh, is using <coughs> Jewish symbols, um, but he's, they're, they're used in a Christian congregation, in a Christian context. And so we find a lot of the phraseology that's the same, uh, that, that comes with this. Um, there are many eyewitnesses about John's life, and uh, one of those is um, uh, Polycrates of Ephesus. He's actually bishop of uh, Ephesus around 130 A.D., so shortly after John. And he says that he remembers the elder John wearing a, uh, a, a petalon, which is a, a little uh, Jewish thing that you wear over your forehead mm-hmm. that... Um, uh, that high priests used to wear, and, and he wore one himself. Um, there's, um, uh, and, and he wore a mitre, like a, like a bishop. Um, engraved on this this little pentalon is is holiness unto God. That that was what was engraved on it. There's uh, also a, a story that Polycarp of Smyrna, one of his students, tells that when he was an old man, he used to go to the public baths in uh, in Ephesus. That was a typical Roman thing uh, to take the waters. And when he got there, he came across a an Egyptian who was a heretic. This guy's an early Gnostic. His name is uh, Serinthus. And we'll see him a little bit later. And and uh, John sees him and cries out to his disciples. He says, "Let us run before the building collapses." <laughs> Serifus, the enemy of truth, is inside. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's our Saint John. And um, anyway, next time when we come back, we'll take a look at at the uh, at the structures of this first century, second century. Uh, church, the second generation, and what we have by way of of the worship that was being done, what we know about what the mass looked like. This is, you know, in, in 100 A.D. Um, we'll take a look at uh, baptismal creeds and the teachings of the early church. So, ooh, this sounds are. great! Another fantastic show, Father. Yeah. Really enjoyed this look at, at Saint John. Yeah, the beloved. The beloved. All That's right, great. shall we close with a prayer and your blessing? Yeah. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was as in the, the beginning, beginning, is now, and, and ever shall, shall be, world without, without end. end. Amen. Amen. May Almighty God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father. Okay. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight. <laughs>